Race-based medicine for pediatrician, it's a thing of the past. Health disparities, the perspective of an actual victim. Living well and helping our planet. We've got Zoe and a lot more on this edition of Black Health Now. Welcome to the Black Health News with Dean and Doc. With Dr. Michael Lenore and Mr. Ellis Dean and medical experts from all over the world and now. Mr. Ellis Dean. Hi, I'm Ellis Dean. You know, we've talked a lot on this program about race in the practice of medicine. Well, today we have some new insights on that front. My partner, Dr. Michael Lenore, has the latest. Well, Ellis, you know, today was pretty much a game changer. The American Academy of Pediatrics said they would no longer use race uh, in the research uh, that's done on children. Now, the rationale is that there have been a number of studies that look at differences uh, in racial and ethnic groups uh, as it relates to outcomes in health. Uh, the, probably the classic example is there's a certain kidney disease, and in that kidney disease, there was a different formula for moving forward with kidney transplants for African Americans as opposed to whites. And it turned out that the formula always pushed African Americans beyond the parameter that would allow them, parameter meaning um, the um, measure that would allow them to get kidney transplants. And so consequently, because of that formula, almost 90,000 African Americans did not get kidneys because they were considered not eligible. When the formulas were recalculated, it turned out the formula was wrong. And so that denied all of these people kidney transplants resulting in deaths in many, many instances. Um, the, the fundamental crux of this argument is that you can't look at an African-American and tell basically how black they are. I mean, we all are composites of white Indians uh, and, um, and Africans. And so consequently, when we look at an African-American, we really can't tell what part of him is responding to what. And so because of this confusion and because it, does, it doesn't seem um, that this matters uh, in the research community, they're going to take race out as a parameter, height, weight, gender, all of that uh, is going to be considered uh, and some of the social determinants, but definitely not race. Okay. Okay. I got it. One more thing. Here's what confuses me about it. They don't have any trouble telling me I'm black. And when they tell me I'm black, they don't have any trouble, uh, you know, measuring the fact that I don't have good outcomes in cardiac disease. I don't have good outcomes in cancer. I don't have good outcomes in asthma because I'm black, which means that probably we're missing some element uh, that distinguishes me as a black person uh, in the healthcare system. What, I, what I'm hearing as a, as a, as a lay person in, in this whole uh, discourse is moving, trying to move towards a situation where people that have been the victims, for lack of a better term, of systemic bias and uh, in healthcare are now going to be removed. They're now trying to remove that piece that caused the most of that systemic bias, and that is race. So when, when you walk into a, a healthcare facility and, 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 and people talk about that from the past and in the present and in recent times, when they walk into a facility, it's not because they're not having poor outcomes because of something that's inherent in them. It could be something that is specific into the bias of the actual practitioner. And so if we try to say we're going to take that out in whatever way, because, oh, we're going to use a scientific methodology. That's assuming that the person that's going to be treating now has no bias whatsoever when it comes to race. And I, I think that's foolhardy to, to think that that could happen. You, you know what I think where it boils down to, Ellis? I think it boils down to the fact that maybe we shouldn't me measure race, but we should be measuring racism. Ellis, this is an important discussion. I guess the good news is that the medical community, my fellow doctors, are beginning to acknowledge and come to terms that their implicit biases and the effects have an effects on their patients. I'm especially proud of the recent work by my colleagues at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Hi, 
Hi everyone, my name is Sonia Taneja. I'm a PGY2 in the Boston Combined Residency Program. And I'm Bob Vinci, the Chief of Pediatrics at Boston Medical Center. I'm Tom Kariakos, the PGY3, also in the Boston Combined Residency Program. And we're here to talk about our paper about biased communication in medicine. Communication is fundamental to medical practice. And historically, miscommunication has led to medical errors. And as a result of that, we responded by developing standardized tools for communication. However, our communication about patients is not objective. It is sometimes impacted by the inherent prejudices and biases we have. And as a result of that, has led to inadequate healthcare. Sonia, what are some examples of biased communication? So in our paper, we present a case of an infant with omphalitis whose family was seen as disengaged because they were absent from the bedside. This assessment of them being disengaged was transmitted across the multidisciplinary care team during handoffs and in documentation. But we later learned that this family was experiencing housing insecurity and were absent because they were trying to retain their housing. After multiple nights spent in the hospital, they were in danger of losing their shelter placement. This is one of many examples of value judgments that we make of families. And the race, gender identity, developmental ability, and English proficiency of patients all play into our quick judgments of them. We may assume that patients with limited English proficiency will be more burdensome on rounds. We may perceive a black teenage patient exhibiting ADHD behaviors as aggressive rather than hyperactive. And we, see, we may see a parent that is not at bedside as disengaged rather than as someone who has competing demands as a parent. So let's talk about some potential impacts of biased communication in the hospital setting. I think it's a really important question, guys, because when we assess patients in a way that, in, that is influenced by our pre-existing biases, it can have really significant impacts on the medical care that we provide. Using your example, Sonia, for patients with limited English proficiency, we may actually end up spending less time at the bedside updating patients and families. For patients who have characteristics that are unfairly perceived as being aggressive or non-compliant, we may actually end up calling security on them more often, right? having them be placed in restraints. For patients whose parents have competing interests, like the patient in our case, it may be the case that uh, those families have protective concerns raised more frequently than other families might. And all of these things play even more an important role in this day and age with the 21st Century Cares Act being what it is, where our subjective judgments can actually make it into documentation in a way that patients and families can view and that may actually worsen distrust that exists between certain communities and the medical establishment. This is a complicated problem, which leads us to the question, what do we do about it? Well, first, we must recognize that the way we speak about patients is not unbiased or benign. Our words can have very real impacts on them and can potentially reinforce existing structural inequalities. I think beyond that, Sonia, we have to remember the fact that our language is influenced by our own pre-existing biases. And those biases are common and learned which means that we can take intentional efforts to unlearn them and to disentangle our subjective judgments from our objective assessments of patients. Yeah, and the last thing I would add is that our institutions have a role. We need to invest resources into teaching all of us about the impact of medical communication and biases and how it can impact patient care. Thank you so much for watching our video abstract. We hope that you are interested in learning more and that you read our paper. Thank you. Thanks. You know, we talk so much about health disparities, but we rarely have a chance to discuss it with an actual victim. Recently, our special correspondent, George Strait, had the opportunity to talk with a young woman for whom racism in medical decision-making almost cost her life. Thanks, Allison. You're right. Health disparities are a huge problem for African-Americans. I think so much so that we've become numb to the statistics but behind each of those numbers is a real person, a victim, if you will, people like Jenna Reich. Uh, Jenna is a nurse and founder of the Endometriosis Coalition, but a few years ago, she was given the equivalent of a medical okie doke if you will. Jennifer, <laughs> Jenna, thanks for being with us and uh, sharing your story. What happened? Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, you know, what happened? It's, it's like, where do we even start with this story? So I, found out quite a few years ago um, when I was on my journey to figuring out my endometriosis diagnosis, I actually learned that I had these two issues with my heart that I was born with that I just mm -hmm. didn't know about. And at that time I was told, these are no big deal. 
you don't need to worry about them. No follow up is needed and kind of just went on my, with my life uh, with that. But then about four years later, I started having some really strange symptoms that were new for me. Um, so I've been a distance runner pretty much my entire life. And I just started noticing that my runs were becoming a little bit more difficult. My legs would feel really heavy in the middle of them. I'd feel really dizzy afterwards. My heart rate would get really high and it just was mm. very out of character for me. Mm. And then over time I noticed I was getting slower. It just was just very, just this strange um, decrease in my physical capacity. And so, you know, I kind of just chalked it up to maybe it's Maybe I'm just getting older. Maybe <laughs> no, but you're a young woman. <laughs> Maybe I'm just out of shape. I don't know. Um, but then, one time, with 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 time, I started having chest pain, even when I wasn't mm. working out. One particular run I had was really tough. Same thing. Legs felt really heavy, and I actually felt like I was going to pass out after it. And usually, I would recover after about like an hour or so. But this time, that wasn't happening. I still felt just really bad. I had my taken to the hospital. And I got admitted there. We did a rainbow of tests while I was in the hospital. Um, and I kept saying to them, I know I have these heart conditions I was born with. Like, could any of this be due to that? And I kept being told, no, 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 no. Couldn't be, can't be. And so I just, you know, let them run all of their tests, even though I knew in the back of my head, I have something that very well could be causing all of this, but they just wouldn't listen to me. Um, in that particular admission, I had one doctor who just wasn't hearing me when I was telling him how I felt. And then I found out later that he wrote in my chart that I had a hard time explaining my symptoms for a nurse. So he didn't, it's not even that I was not explaining them correctly. He just felt like I wasn't, I wasn't explaining them correctly. And so I was just kind of dismissed by him because of that. And I was really or, taken. Or, or it, was, it was your fault, not his. Right, exactly. And I was really upset about that. And I was thinking, like, why is this so upsetting to me? And I realized it's because this is a document that's going to follow me through my entire medical history, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime a doctor asks to see my records, anytime somebody consults, they're going to see this note from this physician saying that I don't know how to explain my symptoms. And so before anyone even sees me, they have an idea of what type of patient mm -hmm. I'm going to be and how harmful and damaging that that is. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So 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 so, so uh, you know you you weren't getting what you what you needed. You weren't getting what you wanted from from uh, from this this first encounter. So uh, what did you do then? Well, and I actually said to the doctor that was discharging me, I said I've done this before, where I've had to figure out what's wrong with me, and I'm going to do it again. And so when I left, I started doing my homework specifically about these conditions that they told me I had a few years ago, and I sought out all of the top specialists that were doing the leading research in these things. Um, so I, I took a trip from Los Angeles to Mayo Clinic to get an opinion there. Um, and then I went to Stanford and got another opinion there and, and then ultimately learned through testing that, you know, there was something very wrong with my heart and that it was likely the cause of all of my symptoms. And they recommended open heart surgery to correct it. So if you hadn't had that open heart surgery, what could have happened? Well, um, many people with my condition that I talked to because I'm in a support group have had heart attacks and that is how mm -hmm. they were diagnosed at the time of heart attack, young people who otherwise have nothing wrong with them. Um, so that was probably likely my fate. And I learned that that chest pain that I was feeling was my heart not getting enough oxygen. So I think about it all the time. I go on these runs out in the Los Angeles and the canyons and I'm always think I was always thinking, oh, God only knows what could happen to me out there. So, so what, why do you think the doctors initially didn't hear you? You know, I think one in part is that I presented with something that wasn't just clear cut and this is what it is. And I, I found in my experience as a patient and as a practitioner that, you know, when patients kind of present with these mysterious type of symptoms that don't have a diagnostic criteria that just says this is what it is or this isn't what it is, when tests come back negative, it seems that the default is to say that nothing's wrong or nothing's going on. Do you think misogyny and racism had anything to do with this? Uh, misogyny, probably. You know, I, I bring my husband to every single doctor's appointment with me. Um, and I shouldn't have to do that because I know more than him about medicine. He's a software <laughs> developer. I shouldn't have to bring him to appointments. 
But I do know that when he can vouch for me and say, that's true, I have seen this and this is happening to her, mm. it's it just feels like a different conversation than when it's mm. just me and a practitioner. And, you know, medicine is predominantly male. And so the majority of my doctors are male. And so that's just the experience that I, I tend to have. And I even notice sometimes when I bring him with me, they speak to him instead of to me, even though I'm the patient. Um, and as far as race goes, you know, that's always in the back of my mind because we know that bias is a real thing in medicine and it exists and it would be kind of naive of me to have an experience and not think, does this have anything to do with the color of my skin? We're clients <laughs> essentially, but somehow we come in with this idea that we're just kind of like at their beck and call and, and that's really not true. Like we're there for a service and we have every right to demand good care and ask for transparency and expect to just be treated with respect for something we're paying to be there for. Right. Jenna, do you want to add, add anything else? This has been terrific. Yeah, I think just to encourage people that, you know, even though that this is common, there are doctors that are willing to listen to you and that do want to help and take care of you. And sometimes it just takes a little bit more effort and search to find these physicians, but they are out there. Jenna, thanks a lot. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. Thanks, George. In a moment, living well and helping our planet. But first, a note about prostate cancer. Being black is still a risk factor for getting prostate cancer. I'm Dr. Mike Lenore, the Ethnic Health Report. From the American Cancer Society, according to statistics, and based on 2016 to 2018, the lifetime probability that a black man would die from prostate cancer is 1 in 26, compared to 1 in 44 for white men. Some good news. As of 2019, the prostate cancer death rates for black men has gone down since it peaked in 1993. Improved survival rates may be due to better surgical and radiology treatments and the use of hormone therapy and early detection. Our living well expert, Andrea Bro usually gives us tips on how to stay healthy. Well, today, she shows us that while we stay healthy, we can also help our planet to stay healthy. As global warming and climate change becomes a reality, there is urgency in what we do now to save our planet from destruction. So let's talk about how to live sustainably now. Sustainable living means earth-friendly living, and it is not difficult to do. Save energy by running the dishwasher, washing machine, and dryer during off-peak hours. Unplug the coffee pot, blender, and toaster when you're not using them. Reusable cloth bags for shopping and a personal water bottle prevent plastic bags and plastic bottles from harming wildlife and the environment. Go paperless for your holiday and celebration cards, invitations, and all special event correspondence. Recycle by putting your garbage in the correct bins. Also, reuse products many times before throwing them away. By growing your own fruit and vegetables, you ensure they're not produced using pesticides that contribute to water and air pollution. If you don't use a product or clothing anymore, give it to a charity to help reduce waste. And shop at those pre-owned stores. It's an excellent way to get name brands cheap. Buy fair trade products. Fair trade certified means it's produced by a company committed to sustainable production. Drive less and when you must, drive an electric car. Public transportation is another way to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Don't waste food. Save leftovers for your lunch or even freeze them. Use eco-friendly cleaning products. The contents should be biodegradable and certified bio-based. The containers should be made from recycled plastic or glass. For more information on sustainable living tips, check out our blog at healthyhealingeats.com. Thanks for listening. Take good care of yourself. And I'll see you next time on Living Well. Thanks, Andrea. Remember, you can get more tips on healthy eating from her blog, healthyhealingeats.com. Now, I'm in it with Zoe. Let's talk about diabetes. Firstly, there's two types, type 1 and type 2. For type 1, you're either born with it or you're not. So that's another story. Type 2, however, is more common because it stems from external factors, like eating a bunch of junk, not exercising regularly. The list goes on. Here's the explanation on why those things can cause type 2 diabetes. 
Firstly, there's this thing in your body called insulin. You've probably heard of it. Insulin serves as a transporter and regulator for glucose, which is your sugar. This glucose, which we get from food, is how our cells function. So that's where insulin comes in. Our cells have a membrane that only allows certain things in and out. Insulin is one of the keys to open that door so glucose can come in. So if there's too much glucose in your bloodstream and it gets there after the food has been digested, that insulin can only unlock so many doors for that glucose. This results in a bunch of excess glucose sitting in the bloodstream and that causes high blood sugar levels. We'll talk next time about how this can cause type two diabetes. Thanks Zoe. That's our show for this week. And thank you for joining us. Join us next week when among other news, we'll discuss options to abortion, even if you live in a state that outlaws it. And don't forget to get the latest health news for African-Americans at aawellnessproject.org and at blackdoctor.org. For Black Health Now, I'm Ellis Dean. Ellis, thank you, and thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, tell your friends about us. Every week we'll be here talking about the latest in news. Always remember that health is your biggest asset, 